Last time on the rise and fall of Twin Hills. I wish I could be gay, but at a mega church. I love show business and I love church and I love Dick. And I wish there was a way that they could all be together. And then she leaped on top of me and just started beating my chest with her fists. And then like pushing her, her knee into my groin, putting all her weight on it and screaming at me and calling me Steve while she beat the hell out of me. You sleep with one hand on your butt cheek so you get to pull it apart where you fart so that your butt cheeks don't flap. It's like, just fucking fart. Grant, let me hear it. I really do wish you luck with whatever you're doing, okay? That's it. I wonder if you could be at my place by Wednesday. My name is Grant Haish, a food blogger and now podcaster with a story that was as big as the bottomless burrito bowls at Bongo Bills on Brower, and a readership as small as the free shot that comes with the bottomless burrito bowls at Bongo Bills on Brower. Despite recent health code violations, Bongo Bills would be a perfect place to take a date, but I wouldn't know. My marriage, that heretofore I had viewed as flawed but necessary, had fallen apart because of my groundbreaking reporting about megachurch pastor Steve Judson. Put your hand up if you are a married man. Now, keep it up if you are sexually satisfied in your marriage. Ladies, what's wrong with this picture? And what does it tell me about the crisis of divorce in this country? I knew that if I wanted to patch up my life and get back to focusing on my blog, oh my God, that's good.blogspot.com, I first had to finish this story. And to finish the story, I had to find out who had written, stop what you're doing, you f***ing lipped f- boy ass stain needy little ass f- muncher, or else I'm going to f***ing kill you on my car window. This is the rise and fall of Twin Hills. Sure there are reasons Question your process Some outsiders do And to be perfectly, perfectly honest You know there are laughter Some dead or division A story that tells a compromise Since I started my blog and then podcast, I learned that Steve Judson, pastor of Twin Hills Community Church, had forced out his co-founder from leadership and his car, breastfed from his secretary, visited gay bars with his first youth pastor, and let his wife take out her frustrations physically on his boat salesman. And then there was the note on my car, written by someone who clearly wanted me dead. It wasn't signed until I turned it over and realized that it was signed by my neighbor, Greek Frank, who was upset that I had blocked his driveway as I moved the last of my things out of my home and into my car. My blog, oh my God, that's good.blogspot.com, was floundering, but this podcast, while also floundering, had caught the attention of one person who I didn't even know existed. That might be because I had not bothered to look. I'm not an investigative journalist. Or maybe because she had a bone to pick with Steve Judson. That person was the first and only teaching pastor that Steve had ever hired. Her name was Dana Dumsit. D-A-N-A-A, Dumsit, D-U-M-S-H-I-T. I I just want to let you know, this could get my baby killed by talking to you today. I sat down to speak with Dana at a nearby Starbucks inside of Barnes & Noble. 
A striking woman in her 50s, she was dressed in fitted jeans and heels, a Von Dutch trucker hat, and a bedazzled tank top that read, Women Rock. She looked like the type of woman that had lots of money and Midwestern taste. And unlike the others I had spoken to, Dana had attended Twin Hills her entire life. I grew up in Twin Hills. My mom was one of the original choir directors. My dad was one of the original alcoholics. <laughs> R.I.P. He did pass away, uh, drowned in a baptism. Not his, unfortunately. For as far back as she could remember, Dana had worked in and around Twin Hills. She had a knack for church work. And Steve took notice. I was Steve's golden child. I was the chosen one, I guess you would say. He recognized my talents, abilities, my giftedness, my leadership skills. When I graduated from Wheaton College, I was brought on staff at Twin Hills. I began working in the children's ministry because I think that's a natural doorway for women in ministry is to work with the kids, right? And I moved up so fast. Within a year of working in the children's ministry, I was running the children's ministry. Um, then within five years of me running the children's ministry, I had taken over the arts department. I was sitting at the right hand of Steve on the leadership team. I had a seat at the table. It was kind of a lower uh, seat at a adjacent table, kind of like a kid's table at Thanksgiving, but I was in the leadership team meetings within five years of being hired. In a way, Dana reminded me of what I had already learned about Steve, a mix of charisma, confidence, and assuredness that made me instantly like her or want to buy something from her or vote for her or get her to like me. All the things that we as Americans love in a leader. And that's what great church leaders do. They recognize other great leaders and make them submit. But according to Dana, she and Steve had very different ideas of leadership. He believes that the essence of leadership is a leader is the one who goes first. But what I came to discover in terms of my own vision as a leader is I don't believe the leader is the one who goes first. Because a lot of times, you know what happens to the one that goes first? They fall off the cliff and they plummet to their death. I identify a leader as someone who is being followed. Turn around. Are people following you? Well, you're leading. But actually, when she spelled it out, I couldn't tell the difference. What did end up happening is that I did end up off a cliff. And as I fall, turned around and watched the people who I was making eye contact with as I was plummeting. That just ended up being a six-week depression. Totally treatable, not a big deal. According to Dana, her power as a leader, what set her apart and on a collision course with Steve, was that she had the balls to lead women. Not to toot my own horn, I was gaining a big female audience. I'd made a huge splash as the only female speaker at Afterthought, which at the time was the largest women's conference in the country. I think the reason women started really responding to me was because I was giving them some tough love. Any woman who has ever gone to a gynecologist knows that you want to go to a man gynecologist, and here's why. He doesn't have that same equipment that he's operating on. Am I right? So he's going to be more sensitive because he doesn't know what it feels like. So he's going to be gentle because he's like, whoa, whoa, Nelly, right? As a woman, if you go to a female gynecologist, she's going to get in there like throwing her elbows in and, you know, ratcheting things around because she's like, I got one of these. They're resilient. It's not a big deal. Kind of the same thing with leading women is I'm like, I'm not going to put kid gloves on with you and I'm not going to go easy on you because I'm a woman too. I'm going to come in here and let you know who's boss. I'm going to come in here as a female gynecologist throwing elbows around and saying, you can take it. I've got it and I can do this and so can you. And that's how I ended up creating Lead From Behind, our international Christian women's conference that doubled our revenue and created this legion of women who became hardcore followers of Christ and of men. Dana's star was on the rise, but when it came to preaching, Steve was still doing weekends, the Super Bowl of Twin Hills services. That is, if the Super Bowl happened every weekend, multiple times, and there was only one person playing. But maybe it was Steve's growing dependence on Dana, or the fact that by the year 2000, women were considered people by most men, that Steve made Dana an offer she couldn't refuse. I was sitting at this very Barnes & Noble, reading, praying. I think I was about to start witnessing to a barista who had been hitting on me, but that's another story. But at that moment, my phone rings, and it's Steve. And he said, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah. And he said, 
I want you to be the first woman teaching pastor at Twin Hills. I was speechless. I mean, I just sort of, I was choking back tears and I think I whispered, yes. And he said, but you better never lie to me again. I know you're not sitting down. (laughs) I wasn't actually, I was leaning on a bookshelf or I was leaning on a stack of something and I look across the room and there was Steve. He was hiding behind a cardboard cutout of Harry Potter and he was waving at me and he was smiling. He was always watching. He was always in control of everything, (laughs) it turns out. Like God, the ultimate puppet master, Steve would come to control every aspect of Dana's life. He was also trying to control this narrative. The night before, I had received an aggressive invitation to the law offices of Avenatti and Avenatti. If you live in Indianapolis, you've probably seen the billboards. A smiling lawyer, Pam Avenatti, dressed in a teal suit, holds back a pack of leashed pit bulls underneath the slogan, this bitch won't quit. Word of the podcast had gotten to Pam, and she wanted to set the record straight for her biggest client, Steve Judson. I represented Drew Peterson and Scott Peterson, not who you're thinking. So I I got a lot. I got a lot of chuff, you know. I arrived at the offices of Avenatti and Avenatti, not knowing what to expect. Clearly, my podcast or my food blog was hitting a nerve, but whose nerve? If it was Steve's, talking to his lawyer might be the best way to get to Steve, or the easiest way to a defamation lawsuit. Whatever the case, I had nothing to lose. I was living out of my car and using the Twin Hills Wi-Fi to upload my stories from the parking lot. Hoping to clean up before this meeting, I had asked the homeless ministry at Twin Hills if I might take a shower. But unfortunately, they only offered directions to a local YMCA and a free stainless steel coffee mug that read, Jesus was home free too. I took the mug and went to meet Pam. Avenatti is my married name. That is my married name. Again, not related to the other guy, although I wish. (laughs) No, my maiden name is Giuliani. After waiting in the lobby for what seemed like an hour, because it was an hour, Pam, her teal suit flashing, greeted me affably and gave me a tour of her sizable office. Okay, all right, sit down. This is the office. This is fine. You want water or whatever? I don't know. Just help yourself to whatever you want. Okay, these are the dogs. They will be nice. Don't worry about it. One of, oh, no one's missing, but that's okay. The tour kept going. We just painted. I don't know if you can still smell the fumes. I'll be honest, I kind of like the fumes. It's a nice little wake up. That is art for my son. That is art for my daughter. I think you could tell which one I like better. And going. Those are books. You know what I haven't gotten around to yet? The Da Vinci Code. Isn't that funny? At one point, I wasn't even sure if Pam still knew that I was here. Here's my diploma. This is funny. See how they spelled my name wrong? They spelled Pam with two M's. I says, it's fine. You know, Arizona State, they don't give the best diplomas. I graduated summa cum a lot. This is me and Peyton. Manning. This is me and Peyton Manning when he was on the Broncos, which is why I'm giving him the finger. Uh, What else? Oh, that's me and Trump. That's me and Don Jr. That's me and Eric. Oh, this is all of us making the jack-off side at Tiffany. Isn't that funny? Here's me and Reggie Miller. I still can't walk sometimes from that one. I had a spent a week with him one night. Here's me with Bobby Knight. And actually, if you go into the break room, I have his chair that he threw autographed. That's the chair he threw at the student. Isn't that great? Isn't that funny? I still throw it at my assistant sometimes. But despite Pam's good-natured charm, things changed as soon as we sat down and I started asking questions about Steve. I have a few questions about- Fifth! Would you mind answering Fifth! Me? Steve Judson is- Fifth! 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 I don't know. God damn it, Caroline, will you bring in my fifth of Tito's? Oh, got it. Jesus Christ. You know, she was a must hire. She's my daughter. Can you hear my dogs? By any standard, Pam Avenatti was a very successful attorney, but it hadn't always been that way. I used to practice environmental law, and then uh, I'll tell you who don't pay their bills, owls. (laughs) I'll tell you who, who does have a lot of money are the churches. So I got into pastoral law. Do you hear my dogs? Chi Chi, Rodriguez. After several drinks and an awkward encounter where one of Pam's dogs, I think it was Chi-Chi, 
asserted his dominance over me by humping my thigh for what seemed like 10 minutes because it was 10 minutes. She began to loosen up about her biggest client, Steve, and a number of other things. He is a bit of a sex pest. I could say that. That's not a legal term. It's a British term. You watch The Crown? You look like somebody would watch The Crown. You know, much like a girl with a large mouth, it, my retainer is large because I am not cheap. And I have worked with some very, I have worked on some very prominent cases. I represented the first black racquetball player. Okay. I represented Drew Peterson and Scott Peterson, not who you're thinking. I represented the Drew Peterson you are thinking of with the first wife. I represented the guy from Tetris. I think that's a movie now, which pisses me off. So I, I got a lot. I got a lot of chuff, you know. But now between Steve, other pastors and the Catholic Church, Pam's business was entirely pastoral. You know, one of the things I really liked about Steve was that it seemed like he didn't give a shit about me. And that reminded me of my dad. Hey, Carolyn! Carolyn! Oh, she went home. All right. What makes him vulnerable is that there's a lot of kooks in a church, right? So you got a lot of kooks. But here's the thing. If you're somebody who can lead a church, then you're somebody who can lead a jury. And so that's why I like church people. But as a journalist and food blogger, I couldn't help but wonder if Pam felt conflicted. My job is all about showing people the truth. In a way, it is much like Steve's job, or Steve Jobs. After all, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Ultimately, he was wrong, but it is a great line. But to Pam, the truth was something else entirely. The law is not solid, you know what I mean? The law is malleable, you know? And so that's the thing, you can use it however you need it, however that's going to help you. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's like religion. You can kind of pick and choose, right? You know what I mean? Like, I eat pork. Okay, fine. I don't get my period and go into a menstrual hut anymore, mostly because I'm in perimenopause. But the thing is, it's like you pick and choose, right, with religion. And so with law, it's the same way. You pick and choose. As far as I could tell, when it came to the Christians I had met, she did have a point. Perimenopause, fantastic drag queen name, don't you think? A new truth was also becoming evident to Dana Dumsit. She was Steve's first lady pastor that had risen through the Twin Hills ranks to become a leader in the church. But the more power she had, the more influence over her Steve began to exert. Dana. Steve had always been very complimentary of me, even as a teen when I was a Climax kid at Twin Hills. You know, he always complimented my attractiveness, which I took as a compliment for sure. But what Steve had always complimented me on was the length of my neck, which is a sign of beauty, and my décolleté, or what I would call, he calls it a décolleté, I call it, you know, my collarbone, my clavicle, my upper chest, you know, my under chin, the golden triangle, the glow zone, you know, it's not a salacious part of the human body, but for some reason, Steve really noticed that on my particular body, it was good. It, that's an attractive feature. And it's also something that isn't, you know, going to make people stumble in the flesh. It's not the hot spots. It's not the no-go zones. And so he wanted that to be more prominently featured. And so they started bringing in wardrobe. But to really show the decollete and the collarbones, there's not a lot of fashion options. You know, you can do a boat neck. You can do a box neck, you can do a princess cut. No V neck, it had to be, you know, more of a wide U neck. I even tried a Z neck and a W neck, but Steve said it looked kind of like a court jester, and I guess I sort of was. Speaking of hot spots and no-go zones, now would be a great time to share this podcast and to tell a friend about my food blog, oh my God, that's good.blogspot.com. You see, as a now homeless veteran who served two tours in Europe, I'm struggling to make ends meet. Journalism is constantly under attack, and we need it now more than ever. We'll be back after this short break. Steve wasn't only controlling Dana's appearance and what she wore. The longer she worked for Steve, Dana began to see that her body was his choice. I was desperate to have children. I've always longed to be a parent. Also, in regard to my previous comment about serving two tours in Europe, I wanted to cut in and clarify that I am a veteran, not of war, but of two Rick Steves tours to Portugal and Spain. Still, great journalism is needed now more than ever, so please consider supporting my important work. Now, back to Dana and the kids stuff. To me, a woman without a child is like Picasso without paint. You follow? From the moment I 
realized I have secured my place in this organization and I've got good benefits, I was ready to, with my husband Sandy, uh, begin a family. And I remember bringing it up to Steve and he said, that's not going to work. It's not the right time. And he had such a direct line to God. The Holy Spirit was so powerful on him that I trusted him when he said, this is not the right time for you to have a kid or to even consider getting pregnant. And another five years goes by and I'm like, tick tock, I'm 35. That's like 55 in church culture. And in Bible times, you know, you're dead. Well, not the Old Testament. Did you know they lived until like 500 or so? And speaking of the Old Testament, Steve's influence over Dana and her husband reminded me of another sermon from the archives that Steve had preached. I'm talking to the men in the room right now. Pick up your swords and turn to Genesis with me. We're going to talk about how God wants you to shoot your shot. It's based on a story from Genesis chapter 38. In it, Onan is told by his father Judah to sleep with his brother's widow, Tamar in order to keep the family line alive. But Onan just wanted to have sex with Tamar without the responsibility of children. So in a maneuver that is as old as time, whenever Onan slept with Tamar, he only spilled his seed on the ground. Do you know what I hear in that story, beloved? That men of God, like Alexander Hamilton, do not throw away their shot. I am not throwing away my shot. These days, it's called pulling out batch and kill, or child support insurance. But back then, spilling your seed was an abomination to God. Unfortunately for Onan, God kills him for it. Luckily these days, God has changed his mind about this issue, because there isn't a man alive who hasn't had to give the dirt a squirt once in a while. And according to Dana, Steve was like a farmer's almanac when it came to giving advice on planting seeds. And like Tamar, she didn't have much say in the matter. It wasn't uncommon for Steve to give couples marriage advice, to even counsel people on Christian sex. But what I did not know at the time was that behind my back, he was giving very personal counsel to my husband, Sandy, about our intimate encounters. It turned out that when it came to who came at Twin Hills, Steve controlled all the comings and goings. Steve instructed Sandy that if he was having sex with me and he thought the experience was going to terminate in an ejaculation, then he was to shoot it in a plant. It took me years to figure out why that ficus got so big. I wasn't sure, because at this point it seemed that churches, and Twin Hills in particular, operated under a different set of rules. But from the outside, Steve telling Dana's husband to ejaculate into a houseplant to keep her from getting pregnant and not so subtly preaching about it seemed to be crossing a line. But when I brought it up to Pam, Steve's lawyer, who is now well into her fourth vodka and Sprite, she was unmoved. You know, Dana, Dana's an interesting case, right? They say believe women. Eh. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? I'm like a chihuahua. Okay. You know how some people say a really vicious person is like a pit bull? I don't say that. I have five pit bulls. They're fantastic. You know the only dog I've ever been by? A chihuahua. So I'm a fucking chihuahua, right? I was worried. Was Pam telling me that if I continued to pursue these allegations about Steve, she would bite me? What I'm saying is, if you continue with these allegations against Steve, I gotta bite ya. (laughs) All right, capiche? I still couldn't tell, but that was probably because over the course of our conversations, I had been matching Pam drink for drink. What Pam didn't know, and I did, was that I had been sober for years. Maybe it was the combination of nerves, stress, the need for my blog and podcast to do well, my wife's recent departure, my financial obligation to a timeshare I couldn't afford, my realization that my writing wasn't that good, or the fact that I still hadn't had a bowel movement since I began this project, that I decided to let go and let God, and God let me fall off the wagon. Now drunk and disoriented, I struggled to understand anything that Pam was telling me. All right, bottoms up, Rudy Toots. <laughs> what is this, a pantyhose contest? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, COVID was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. I slept for a week, right? I had such a sleep deficit. <laughs> My skin looked amazing. It was like, I looked like Han Solo in the ice thing. <laughs> you watch Star Wars? Did I ever tell you I dated Dane Cook? He's the only guy I ever pegged. Yeah. He liked it. You know what my kid got me in the fish. Fish. Can you believe it? Not fishing. It's fish. The band. It's funny. It's like it's like silly jazz. 
Now you want to hear something? So it's funny. It's like we got a mingo and we got some sun. So let's put them together. And now we're having fun. There's a chicken in the walrus, and the walrus has some money. I imagine this feeling of overwhelming disorientation was similar to what Dana Dumsett felt as her relationship with Steve continued to spiral. On my 44th birthday, I was sitting in our leadership team meeting, and in an aside, Steve leans over to me and says, 50K to kill the gray. I've never colored my hair, and it was starting to go salt and pepper, which my husband Sandy liked. He always had an Emmy Lou Harris thing. And Steve was offering me 50 grand to start doing my roots. So I had a choice to make. Do I begin to alter my appearance, which Steve had always approved of uh, glowingly, to, to, to hold on to my job? As I resisted coloring my roots, I started to subsequently lose leadership positions. I was removed from the board of Lead From Behind, the conference I created, I was demoted in every single position that I held on the Twin Hills campus. I couldn't get into my garage. The garage door opener stopped working. But you see, I'm feeling frustrated at this point. Dana was shocked as Steve quickly stripped her of everything she had worked so hard for at Twin Hills. And it was this fact that Steve might just take her from being an attractive woman in leadership to just a woman that Dana finally gave in. By the time I actually acquiesced and colored my gosh darn gray hairs, I honestly think it was too late. But I did take his 50 grand. And you know what I did with it? I invested it in in vitro fertilization and my husband Sandy and I went on the journey of our lives. But it was too late. Stripped of her roles, Dana spent a few months floundering for a foothold at Twin Hills. But just like the whale did to Jonah in the Bible, Steve had spit her out. On the day I walked into Steve's office to resign, I told him, <laughs> you know what? I have one viable egg at New Life Fertility Clinic and nothing standing in the way of me bringing that to term. And also, I've taken a job with World Vision. And when he realized that my resignation was true and that it was real, he picked up his glass desk and he threw it through a plate glass window. I screamed out, oh my God, the glass ceiling, you know, of the atrium. And he said, you did this. You broke the glass ceiling. She hadn't. Steve had. But then I realized Steve wasn't talking about the atrium. He was making a clever joke about the idea that Dana had been the first woman pastor at Twin Hills, therefore breaking the glass ceiling, which I did think was a clever thing to say in such a heated moment. Here's Dana. Two weeks later, I'm sitting at the coffee shop in the Barnes & Noble, much like I was before, and my phone rings, and it's my doctor from the New Life Fertility Clinic. There's been a break-in. And of all of the things, you know, lose cash in the register, whatever, that have been stolen, the only thing that the thief took was my one viable fertilized egg. It's gone. It's been abducted. I couldn't tell what Dana meant. Did she think that Steve had something to do with her embryo going missing? And did she think that embryo, which has fewer cells than a fruit fly, was the same as a child being abducted. Oh yeah, it's his insurance to keep me from ever talking. But guess what, Steve? I'm 50, I'm nifty, I don't give a shit anymore. And you know what, I'm actually glad I didn't have kids. We are so much happier. She then went on to talk for another hour about how life begins in the womb, even if it's a test tube. But I still had more questions. Could Steve, this revered figure and man of God, have kidnapped an embryo just to control Dana? I wanted to bring it up to Pam, but when I did... Hey! Stop! Shut it! Shut up! Shut up! You shut up! You shut up! I'm here to tell you that according to the state of Indiana, he does not have to admit any wrongdoing, and Miss Dumb Shit has the settlement to do whatever she wants with, okay? Which I think, this is between us, she should get new tits. That's a personal opinion, that's off the record, but she should get new tits, because one looks like it's trying to escape. Caroline! Caroline, bring in that picture of me motorboating Mark Driscoll at CPAC. Caroline, bring in that picture of me motorboating Mark Driscoll at CPAC. 
It's fantastic. I am motorboating him. Can you believe it? Oh, you'll love this picture. Oh, you'll love this picture. But I don't remember seeing any picture. The next thing I remember was waking up on Pam's office floor. The sun had set and Pam and Caroline had gone home. Since the building was locked, I climbed out a first floor window and sprained my ankle. Oh God. Now limping, hungover, and fully in the throes of my addiction, I stumbled to the only place I knew that might serve me. Bongo Bills on Brower. Drunk, penniless, and alone, I called out to God for the first time. Jesus Christ, who do I gotta blow to get another margarita? And it was there, crouching in the dark behind the dumpsters at Bongo Bills, that a miracle happened. I had a bowel movement for the first time since starting this podcast. The bad part is that I may have been bitten by a rat as I did. And as I ran, screaming, drunk, writhing in pain across Brower Avenue, I was nearly hit by a car. And not just any car, a Mustang. And not just any Mustang, it was Steve. Hey there, uh, yeah, you need a ride? Next time on the rise and fall of Twin Hills, I discover that while I was blacked out on Steve's lawyer's floor, my phone had recorded Pam making a shocking admission. Jesus Christ, that guy would not let up. Woof. I mean, Steve's the most guilty fucking client I ever seen in my goddamn life. Ooh, these are Krispy Kremes. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna eat them all, of course. <laughs> Accusations won't stick. No, no, no. The accusations won't stick. The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills was created by Mega the Podcast and written by Greg Hess, with characters improvised by Katie Rich and Holly Laurent. Grant Hage was played by Greg Hess. Our theme song was written and performed by Joel Hansen. The series was edited by Hannah Parsons. If you enjoy the podcast, please share it with a friend or rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And you can always support the work of Mega by joining our Patreon or using one of our sponsors. All those links are in the show notes.